Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer and this is day number four of Project Kids Summer Camp. Michael Wan is with me and it feels like it's been kind of a long time since the last one. And for me, certainly, I don't know about you, Michael, but the last couple of weeks have been so crazy. Like my brain like alternates between feeling incredibly brilliant and like scrambled eggs that like, I just can't even like, it's almost exhausting to try and like organize my thoughts. How about you? How you doing friend? This week, uh, and we're just going to jump right in. No even greetings. We're just going to start talking. <laughs> right. This week has been like, I don't even know who I am this week. Mm -hmm. Like there, like I remember having like ideas like a week ago. And I remember like where I was internally, like, like, uh, like where my mind was emotionally where I was. And like, I can't tap into that. And it's not necessarily like I'm like in a bad space. I'm like, I knew where I was a week ago, I'm not there. And I'm like, what's going on with this? Like, you know, am I riding like a normal kind of like wave and I've just not had as much awareness of my inner world or has something kind of shifted? And so I'm playing around with all these different things. We've talked about like, um, you and I have talked about offline a lot about like diet. And mm -hmm. so my diet has changed. So I'm like, does this have to do with diet? Does this have to do with this? Does this have to do with that? But it's like my spiritual, mental and emotional world are like shifting. And, in, and it feels like kind of like what you said, scrambled eggs. Like it's not a bad thing but but some of the stuff i used to have access to i'm i'm not a, i'm not accessing as well and other things like i'm accessing very very well so i want to my nature is to surrender to like you know what's in front of me as opposed to like reaching for something that's not there so yeah this week has been really strange and like our convert just today you know I, ha I had to call you up and say like, hey, can I get an extra 15 minutes? Because everything's all scrambled. But, yeah. but, and here's the thing. And like, you know, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet. But where I really began noticing this, and we're going to come back to this, is when you sent me that text a week ago. That's when it all started getting weird. So, so let's, so, so let me hand it back to you now. Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of the same for me, right? Like this last week or so, has just felt like exactly what you described. Um, and generally I can kind of keep like all the threads that I'm tracking both informationally and just with my own personal feelings and awareness and things like that. Pretty like, and when I say compartmentalized, I don't mean like in the unhealthy way, but I mean like, okay, this is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. And then like, there's these areas where they cross over. And now like this week has almost been like a sense of, um, confusion for me like I have so much information going and things are bleeding over into so many weird different ways uh like that it's just sometimes like it, it's like when you um get dizzy because you drank a little too much coffee that morning and then like you did some repetitive activity that sort of spins you around a little bit you just start to feel crazy or whatever so it's been like a little bit like that um and I've had to sort of work hard to maintain that inner calm <laughs> Sometimes, right? It's, you know, it's not that I'm trying to resist what's happening. It's something, you know, I think we're um, going into increasingly chaotic times. And I think what we're witnessing, like on the political uh, level, is just a symptom, is, is a symptom of that on a certain, right? So, like, for some people, just paying attention to that is keeping them from recognizing that sort of same inner chaos that's going on. And for me, like whatever, like that's boring, like whatever's going on with the political thing and the virus thing right now, like I'm mostly ignoring it. So I'm really feeling some of that inner chaos that seems to be maybe just a, um, uh, an effect of where we are in our, this point in the system or the cycle or like whatnot. And, and I've been looking into some different lines of information that seem to make some of that make sense. But, um, you know, it, 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 it does feel um, when it's happening a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> and I feel sorry for some of the people around me when it's happening. <laughs> yeah, it's um, and and what I tr what I've been trying to do is like, OK, well, where is it easy? Like I'm, I'm always like, you know, not in terms of like, let me go and avoid something, but mm -hmm. more so it's like, where, where is it comfortable? What is, where, where is the support at this particular time? Um, and, and to me, timing is always, is, is one of the most powerful compasses in terms of navigating reality. Like, you know, what happens when relative to, you know, what things are happening at the same time. 
And so I, I indicated like one, you introduce that text, which you sent me a week ago, which introduced me to like this whole John Lilly stuff we're going to get into. And I've shared that with a bunch of people. So that, that kicked off right around the same time as like this collective, like, I don't even know, there, there are a couple ways to look at what's happening on the collective political perspective. But then I've also had, like, I've gone to some strange, like, physical locations and really tapped into some weird earth energies. We talked a little bit about this. And I'm like, all of this is, it's it's connected somehow. And, it, and undoubtedly, I'm glad we're having the summer camp today because it's like, this is what the, in my mind, is what the summer camp is always, is really about, is like, recognizing, recognizing recognizing each of us as nodes and like going through this particular strange time and, and trying to find a, a new type of structure. You know, we're finding another structure as opposed to the structure we've all been told to that. This is where you rest your feet upon. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. So then let's do this. Let's get into the Lily thing. And since I brought the John Lily into your world, I'll just explain sort of my, um, how I've known about John Lilly. So it, I've known about him for many, many, many years for some reason. Like it's always been a name that's been sort of familiar to me, but mostly um, I knew that John Lilly had created the um, anechoic chambers that are now known as float tanks, right? And at some point I also discovered that like John Lilly had um, not created, but been very involved in the television show Flipper which I had been obsessed with as a child uh, in a similar way that I was obsessed with the Land of the Lost uh, TV series, but slightly different. Um, and I always thought, oh, that's interesting that a person would work on a TV. I didn't understand how he was working on a TV show. I just somehow intuitively, intuitively or someone had told me that like it was weird that somebody who created a, a TV show about dolphins also created the, uh, the, the float tanks, right? And then later, I also became aware from a, pay, a, a longtime subscriber of these lily waves, right, that are basically wired into our homes and have all sorts of very unusual uh, effects. And so I thought, well, wow, and that that was a, something that came from his work as well. So I'm like, what a weird person, like that has, you know, like a jack of all trades, does all these things. And then I started to sort of, I remember looking up one day, like John Lilly, and I saw he'd written all of these books, right? And the books um, were had very intriguing titles to me. And um, then I started to dig a little further and recognized, oh, okay, the like the float tanks are connected to the dolphin research, right? Okay, and so then that made sense on a certain level to me. And for me, it started to bring up some issues from my own programming as a kid. Um, and then like I got to the place where I realized that he, um, had some some things to do with like MKLs for a kind of programming. And I always had it bookmarked to take a deeper dive into him, but for some reason it kept getting put off and whatnot. And he's never a person that comes up like when you think of MKLs for doctors, you get your Ewan Cameron and your Sidney Gottlieb and you know, like a few others, uh, uh, what's his name, Delgado and a few others that always come up in the research. And when you look at the psychedelic aspect of it, you always get Ken Kesey, Den Timoth uh, Timothy Leary, like some of those people. You don't get John Lilly in the doctors and you don't get John Lilly often in the psychedelics, but he's in my opinion, now that we've taken a deeper look and there's still much more for me to look at, um, that he's kind of one of these people where it comes together in one person in a way that is um, almost more meaningful than any of the threads that are generated by the other characters. And so I'm gonna, so I, I've been meaning, and, and Jeff and I have talked about this a couple of times. Oh, we're gonna look into John Lilly. We're gonna get John Lilly books or whatever. And he follows different threads than I do. He's very into um, blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies. And in one of his sort of groups that he, you know, and alternative technologies related to them, the John Lilly conversation started and somebody posted the meme that I sent to you, Michael, and that I've sent to uh, all the people in the group. And that's really where your and my conversation around this really started to widen open. So why don't you uh, pick up here? So, so is you send me that, and I knew I knew John Lilly's name from from MK Ultra. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I didn't know, I did not know, uh, he was not someone I went deep into, but I can remember coming, reading about Lily Waves and I always had a connotation and, and at least on the surface, there's no correlation, but between John Lilly and Eli Lilly. And I know Li Eli Lilly has like yes. a, uh, that connects to the Bush family and all this sort of stuff. And like, you know, like you, I, 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 com I compartmentalize my world and my mind in a, what I would call a very healthy way as well. And uh, that's another topic, but I think that's a very powerful thing to, to be able to do if you know how to do that correctly. But so I've got like all of these like Lily compartmentalizations. And I remember we talked about John Lilly, used to talk about John Lilly waves a lot when we first started talking when Robert Anton Wilson was... Yeah. Uh, came up because Robert Anton Wilson talks a lot about um, Lily Waves and stuff. Yeah. So um, Will, Lily w had been on my mind and he, in a kind of like a, a, a nefarious sort of way or kind of like a confused way because like, you know, I don't know what camp I put Robert Anton Wilson in, but I, I definitely find him as, an, as someone who I like to read. Yeah. And I know definitely how I feel about Eli Lilly and whether or not they're linked. And I know how I feel about MK Ultra. So anyway, you're telling me about John Lilly and you send me this, you send me this, um, the, that picture, that, that image, that I'll meme. bring it up now. Yeah. And as soon as I saw that face, as soon as mm -hmm. I saw that face and I'm like, and you and I, we've done this before, like in terms of, we'd like to look at faces of people and like, maybe we make connections that don't need to be, to be made, but I disagree that they don't need to be made. I think this falls underneath like um, sim similarities and faces at the very least fall underneath, like, you know, the signature of doctrines or the doctrine of signatures, just like, yeah. you know, how like there's archetypical sit. When I saw that face, I like, I, something inside me like stopped. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. Um, and I, I'm not saying that I've seen this man before, but there was something in there which was very, was very like not quite unsettling, but but it, it stopped me. And then reading through this, like there were certain things, uh, certain of these bullet points which were really, really, really meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, it was a Thursday night. It was like around eight o'clock East coast time. And um, I was like in a parking lot waiting for my, my older son. He plays soccer on a, on like a, like on a fancy team. And so I was waiting for that and I'm walking around, I'm looking at this and I was also making my plans for the next day. And I have a good friend of mine. Um, I have a good friend of mine who I was going to go up and see. It was um, who lives about 30, 45 minutes away from me. We had scheduled for about um, we had scheduled for a couple of weeks that I was going to see him the next day. And I was reading about John Lilly. And you mentioned how John Lilly was the inventor of like, you know, the modern sensory deprivation tank. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot about my, um, sensory deprivation. I've never actually, like, I hadn't been in one before, but I've read about them before, and I've always been intrigued by them. I remember the first time I was introduced to them conceptually came from, like, a like a magic perspective about how, like, back in the olden days, they used to have this thing. I think they called it, like, a, like a, a witch's sack where you would go in a blanket and... And you'd be tied up in the blanket, and then from that rope would go over a um, would go over a branch, so that you're like hanging in this blanket. You're not like dying, but you can't see anything, you can't hear anything. You're spinning, but it creates a sensory deprivation sort of experience because that will change consciousness in this very interesting way. So that was my. I always mm -hmm. link sensory deprivation, like modern, from going back to like these older kind of medieval, if not even older than that, um, practices non-technology practices so anyway going back to like what my next day was going to be I was going to go up to see my friend my friend Seppi and Seppi works out of like a like a like a holistic spa and um there are sensory deprivation tanks in this spa and he's like he's been for like at least two years he's like anytime you want to go and take the sensory deprivation tank you know I, I you could go in and get I, I get two free passes and you know I think you're going to find it enjoyable and I've always been intrigued but like never enough to actually do it it wasn't like it was there was a resistance it was just like you know I didn't feel like really drawn to do it so it was literally 12 hours after you give me this thing and I have this like stop 
in my tracks from looking at this guy's vision and reading about him that I'm like, oh, I got like, I'm going up to Seppi and he's got the sensory deprivation tank and I'm going up there actually with Jenny and I'm going to be up there for a couple hours. And I was like, is there any way that I could go and take one of these sensory deprivation uh, floats? And he's like, let me go and check. And he's like, there's only one opening. And it's like, you know, for the whole week. And it's that one hour I'm, I'm arriving. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because if everyone here is familiar with the stuff which 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 you shared in that meme, which is like, you know, the the coincidence control. And so here is like, you know, four levels of coincidence, like lining up, like both experientially and then just mentally, like, you know, that's a mental coincidence, but it's also an experiential coincidence. I'm going to go have an experience which is lining up perfectly. So going back to where we began this conversation which was wow this past week has been weird mm -hmm. when i really began to realize that it's weird was following <laughs> following that like you know walking through that that was and this was if i recall that this was pro this was on thursday so it was 2 days after the election yeah right it was last week the election so that's the timeline of all of this sort of stuff the election being kind of like a nationwide mental exercise yeah um so a couple of things like it, it cascaded a couple of things for me i'm interested we can I, we can talk about this document in a little bit but i also have been looking at the work that you've producing been producing during some of this time um and I, uh, just thinking about it, you know, we've talked in this group about synchronicity and about how this was a, uh, an intelligence technique that was picked up by Tavistock based on things that Carl Jung and, and uh, Wolfgang, uh, what was his name, pa Wolfgang Pauli and some of these others were doing, right? This feels like the idea of, so, of a coincidence as an intelligence sort of tool, right? feels more American and more Randian in nature. You've been talking about some of Rand Corporations, right, which is based here in Los Angeles and Santa Monica. Um, actually, I have a cousin who used to work for, for Rand Corporation and now works for the NSA, but, um, you know, this feel like this idea, uh, and, and John Lilly feels more, uh, more Randian in his sort of way that he, exists in this than some of the others who feel more Tavistockian, right? Like Tavistock, Tavistock feels much more about like mm, culture and like an emotionally generated mental state, right? Where like the Rand stuff feels more like deep into the deep science of the brain, right? Kind of thing and more um, like more of a scientific thing as opposed to a sociological thing, although they, they play out sort of together, right? Um, and so I, I was looking at your stuff and it's, it, it's a different, like, it, it, you know, we were onto it as synchronicity and now looking at it as coincidence, it changed the nature of some of my experiences, right? It felt, the things before felt, felt more like synchronicities and now they've changed to feeling more like coincidences. And I don't know if that is just um, because like language is so powerful in our minds and the way we think about the thing changes the sort of fabric and the nature of the occurrence, right? But the idea of like coincidence control takes it into like a much more like brain mechanistic kind of uh, like, I don't know how to, I don't know that I have the language for this, but when you look into what he was studying, right, with brain electrodes and uh, like telepathy between dolphin and human and human to human and all of this kind of stuff, it, it, it feel like maybe one feels more like, oh, I don't know what the language to, like one feels more like a design thing and another feels more like a program, right? Like, you know, and so I've just been noticing this whole coincidence stuff. The other thing that's felt unusual to me is because the gen the media that's been generated in, over the course of the last week has been um, unusual in nature for me. Like there's almost nothing been on YouTube that I'm interested in looking at, right? It's changed the nature of like the way that I correlate things, right? Because I look at a variety of things and notice certain patterns across stuff, but there's almost no YouTube video or anything that I'm wanting to look at. And so that has kind of created like, um, 
a vacuum where some of this stuff overlaps for me and I'm looking, I'm now finding it in other places, which also sort of changes the nature of it. Um, yeah, so I don't know what you think about any of that stuff, but, and as far as someone's talking about Eli Lilly Pharmaceuticals in here, I just wanna draw people's attention to the fact that Eli Lilly, like they obviously create a lot of pharmaceuticals, but the one that they're most famous for is Prozac, which really changed the mental state and the consciousness of the nation. Right. And that was something that came about really in the like 80s and 90s. There was even a book called Prozac Nation that was written. Right. Um, but that came about in the 80s and the 90s. And that would have been the amount of time after like R&D following some of the things that were made discovered by John Lilly's research and the applications of some of his technologies. Right. So I'm curious, like there even though you and I don't necessarily need there to be a, a, a factual or an informational for sure connection, it can just be sort of a feeling. I actually think that there may be some more direct lines and strands. I don't know whether they're related. You mean with the lily and the lily? The lily and the lily. Yeah, I mean, I, so here's the other thing. So randomly, ra you know, randomly, <laughs> and, and, by, and by the way, here's the other thing. Like I never thought about like Rand as in Randy. Mm -hmm. And like then like all of the sort of implications with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fact that I sent you, I sent you like some messages from Randy, like another Randy. I'm like, what, uh, like what asking you about your thoughts on that. So there's, there, there's definitely some, some, um, you know, we talk about the compartmentalization, like, you know, research to me is very compartmentalized. What is the stuff which I know is like fact? What is the stuff which I know is at least book fact? At least I can show like this. I can show that where this line of thought is coming from, whether it's it's been planted there or not, I don't know. And then there's the stuff where it's like, you know, it's not even connected or whatever, other than the fact that um, for, for like higher reasons. So um, that being said, so for whatever reason, I get the desire to watch the movie. Um, and I really haven't seen a movie for a long time. Um, JFK, Oliver Stone's JFK. Okay. And I definitely like, and I remember watching that, like, I think that came out like probably like mid, like 92, 93 would be yeah. my guess. Yeah. Um, maybe even earlier than that. But I remember, I remember it like, I was like probably like in high school or college at the time. And I remember like liking it kind of, but not really liking it, but watching it again now is really, really um, uh, interesting to put in concept of like, you know, the ideas that were being introduced um, but then that got me then going down to, um, well, here's a, uh, the whole King Kill 33 and what's his name? Jo uh, Shelby Doward, what have you. Um, is, do you know? Shelby, Dow Shelby Downard, I think. Yeah. I always get his name uh, backwards, but he always talks about like, you know, name places and the, and the, and the significance. Thank you so much. Um, I got some tea. Uh, um, where was I going with that? So anyway, so I he talks a lot about um, the similarities of names and like the Masonic sorcery of 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 the significance of names. But I wanted to go down that with the with the Lily connection. But I wanted to bring it back a little bit. Um, you're bringing up something really interesting as it relates to um, the difference between Rand and and Tavistock. And you're right, they're different, but they seem to fit together. And I don't. I don't quite know um, how I want to go and separate them, but they they do seem to be separate. And then this idea of um, not so much for me the word coincidence, but coincidence control. And maybe we should go and read down read out the line where it talks about coincidence control because that feels um, that feels like a direction which which makes sense. So where is it? So these are this is where does this even originate? Do you know the history of what? So let me, let me, um, I'm just going to read it to people. So as we go through it, so look, we're not just jumping right in. So there seems to be like, he had some versions of this, like that he's been, it, it seems to be something that he came about later, late, like after the bulk of a lot of his research and in his later seventies, I believe is when so his later out. years, like when he's more just like a hippie tripper kind of thing and not doing so much direct uh, you know, deep scientific research that he had been doing at a time. And this is, so, so I, I read this and then I've also read a few other versions where there's some commentary back and forth, but basically this is a document generated by 
John Lilly that says, there exists a cosmic control center, CCC, with, 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 with a galactic substation called Galactic Coincidence Control, within which is the Solar System Control Unit, SCCU, within which is the Earth Coincidence Control Office, ECCO. The assignment of responsibilities from the top to the bottom of this system of control is by a set of regulations, which translated by ECCO for humans is somewhat as follows. To all humans, if you wish to control coincidences in your own life on the planet Earth, we will cooperate and determine these coincidences for you under the following conditions. One, you must know, assume, simulate our existence and echo. Two, you must be willing to accept our responsibility for control of your coincidences. Three, you must exert your best capabilities for your survival programs and your own development as an advancing advanced member of ECHO's Earthside Corp Corporation of Controlled Coincidence Workers. You are expected to use your best intelligence in this service. Four, you are expected to expect the unexpected every minute, every hour of every day and of every night. Five, you must be able to maintain conscious thinking, reasoning, no matter what events we arrange to happen to you. Some of these events will seem cataclysmic, catastrophic, overwhelming. Remember, stay aware, no matter what happens, apparently happens to you. Six, you are in our training program for life. There is no escape from it. We, not you, control the long-term coincidences. You, not we, control the shorter-term coincidences by your own efforts. Seven, your major mission on Earth is to discover, create that which we do to control the long-term coincidence patterns. You are being trained on Earth to do this job. Eight, when your mission on planet Earth is completed, you will no longer be required to remain, return there. Nine, remember the motto passed to us from GCC. So that's a galactic, galactic uh, uh, hold on, like in galactic coincidence control via SSCU, which is Solar System Control Unit. Um, cosmic love is absolutely ruthless and highly indifferent. It teaches its lessons, whether you like them, whether you like, dislike them or not. So that was the thing that started all this. I've read a couple of other things that go into some other things, including like where he talks about SSRI, solid state something or solid state reality versus some other things, which was interesting and goes into some other directions. But we you know what this- well, Hold on, real quick for that. Isn't Prozac all about SSRI management? Yes. Yes, so, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So, so, so now we've got a double. We've got Lily, Lily, SR, SSRI, SSRI. Right. So and it's all mind control. Where did you? So I, where? Where's? Oh, that's interesting. Eli Lilly is from Baltimore. Is it really? I, I thought it was based in Indianapolis. Is there a history from Baltimore originally? The person, the, the gentleman was- Holy Baltimore. crackers. Okay, so I wanted you to finish this because I was about to go straight to Baltimore for another reason. So, all right, this is where it's going to start getting really good. All right, so I, in this document, there isn't reference to SSRI, but in some of the other ones I looked at re revolving around this, there are. If you guys just go look up John Lilly um, on the, you know, ECCO, you'll find a variety of different rantings and ravings about this stuff, right? But you know what this sounds like to me? You know, like it sounds like a, a much, much more like, like, you know how in the alternative realms, especially if you're into the synchro mystic or the more weird stuff, there's always this conversation about how we agreed to come here and one of the rules on the way in was that you got your memories wiped. And so maybe before you got your memories wiped, you threw some breadcrumbs out for yourself that when you would come across those things in life, you would start to remember, right? Kind of thing like we've, you've heard this talk before, right? Certainly, certainly. Okay. So this sounds kind of like that. Like let's just- Very much like that. This sounds just like, uh, Earth is some kind of like machine or enclosure, whether it just be a like mental or like energetic enclosure, not necessarily in a glass in a dome kind of thing, right? And that when you like agree to participate in this, these are the, the rules, right? Which means that there's another world on the other side of some of this, right? That we came into this from. Now I've had conversations with other people in the alternative media about their awareness of how it is that they came to be here, right? And, and one other person in the alternative media and myself had almost an exact similar feeling about how it was. And for me, it was, I was walking up 
to a party in a back alley, right? Like the way most of my parties in underground warehouses are, right? I was walking up and there was just a dark, wet, dank alley. And there was a door with like a green neon light above it. And there was no doorman, which was weird. But for some reason, I decided to turn the knob and go in anyway, right? And on the floor, there was a puddle. And I walked toward the puddle and walked into the puddle and into the water. And then I was in this. And that's how I arrived in this reality. Like that is like a distinct feeling that has come to me over and over. And I know of one other person who has almost the exact similar kind of thing. Now, a puddle on the floor going into a body of water sounds quite similar to a tank with a puddle of water on the bottom. Yeah. It's not full of water. It's just on the bottom, right? When you go into that, I mean, you went into a pod. Here they have these rooms that just have about, you know, 18 inches of water, right? That you kind of can go in and lay in, right? But it's a body of water on a floor in a room, right? And so like, to me, the idea of entering into this system, right? Going in, like I decided, I had that feeling when I was walking up to the door that eh, I don't know if I should do this, but I'm more curious than I am scared. So I'm going to do this, <laughs> right? Kind of thing that this kind of, I'm not saying that it's that, but it sort of lines up with that. And these stories that we've heard for so long about getting our memories wiped when we came in here and having to figure out based on, you know, nuggets and stuff like that. That's what this sounds like to me. And um, I would love to know sort of like really not the reported on now, like Genesis of where he came up with this, you know what I mean? But I'd really love to hear the story and just another part of the co controlled coincidence is somebody showed up recently that I'll be talking to um, tomorrow who knew John Lilly. Um, and so I'm hoping maybe I can get some further understanding of where some of this comes from. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's what this sounds like to me. What do you think of Michael? So uh, I, th there's a whole bunch of things. I've got a lot of mixed feelings upon reading this. Like a lot of it makes me me roll my eyes. A lot of it's like, and, and let's put this in context. So let me first give a little bit of context on, on John Lilly. If you do just like, like 10, 15 minutes of like research. So he, uh, he comes from a well-to-do family in the Midwest. <laughs> He goes to Caltech in like, I think the thirties, he's in the same class as Jack Parsons, yep. uh, comes out East, uh, gra goes to school at UPenn. And then he gets involved in the entire like uh, military industrial complex psychiatric research that was happening after World War II, Rockefeller Foundation, National Institutes of Health, all of this stuff in like the fifties into the early sixties. And then like, then he does like this change. He jumps out of that world and then he goes into the counterculture world. And then he becomes like, you know, he, he's like you doing a lot of like horse tranquilizers. He's doing a lot of acid. He's like contemporaries with like Leary and that entire, like he wasn't like necessarily like, you know, like hanging out with like the, the kids during the summer of love. He was like the, 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 the leadership. He was like the, the, the guides during this time. And then during like the 70s and 80s, maybe like he kind of became more of like, a, um, like became even more and more further like out there in terms of like, whether you want to call that new agey or what have you. But his beginnings are very much like within the, uh, the, the military industrial com control or complex, military industrial complex, um, uh, affluent families, well, to, like, you know, like the families that rule the world, uh, maybe not quite at that level, but, but he's, he's hanging out with some folks. So, so I take all of that with a grain of salt and particularly when looking at this and all of this is coming from like the latter part of his, his life's trajectory. Um, the dolphin research all happened in the, in the fifties and sixties. I find it like, you know, whether it's coincidence or not, it's the same place where Jeffrey Epstein's island was, you know, right mm -hmm. in St. Thomas. Like, I mean, but again, you know, whatever, maybe that's connected, maybe that's not connected. But that being said, that all being said, um, 
And I'm assuming when I see this, like there's two schools of thought. Like one is this, like, is this the rantings of a guy who's just kind of lost it? Mm -hmm. Or is this, or is this something which is deeper? And my sense is this is something which is deeper. And when it's deeper, I think that like, I think the syntax Mm -hmm. matters a lot with this. And if you look at the syntax of a lot of this, like the actual word structure and how the words are positioned, like some of it's kind of awkward. And when you see awkward structure, particularly when it is um, uh, specific. Like you could have like just random awkward structure of someone who doesn't understand grammar. But then when you know someone who's like an NLP expert and their 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 syntax is awkward, it's because it's programming. Like right away, you're like. Duh, 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 duh. So yeah. that being said, um, here are the ones which this is what jumps out at me the most. It's number six. Uh, um, or no, it's six and seven. So, or, but I want to go to seven. Seven's where I want to go. Your major mission on earth. So right away, your major mission. So there's no, there are other missions, but there's major mission on earth is to discover, create. Well, which is it? Discover, create. Um, so this is where the syntax, I don't have an answer, but I'm saying this is what is being triggered in these words. So like there is like these words are are interchangeable that discover discover implies that something that's already there create means you've already like you've created it so it's like you know there this is implied that there is that discovering and creation are one and the same that which we do so we as the people who are writing this to control the long-term coincidence pattern so this is a little bit like clunky this this language right here but the reason i want to bring that out is like that's exactly what we're talking about we want to figure out the mechanism and they're telling us this is your mission this is exactly what you should be doing and it's not only discovering it but you're going to be creating it because as you're creating it's almost like this this you know the 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 snake eating its tail sort of thing there's a circle logic built into it and then there's the colon and it says you are being trained on earth to do this job. So this is kind of makes sense. I'm like, well, hold on. Is this my mission or is this my, or is this my training facility? Right. You know? And so again, like, like, are, are these the rantings of a, of a madman? Are these like, you know, kind of like a, a madman who's got something distorted and he's pulling something through? Or is this something which has always been part of this military industrial complex intelligence um, network, which which we've talked about before, which probably is much, much deeper than like, you know, space being much more than what we think it actually is. But that's how I'm approaching or that's how like I jumped into um, and what pulled me in to these statements. That was my my most significant point. Okay, so a couple of things. So I think that this goes, have you ever seen the television show Person of Interest? Mm-mm. Okay, so there, there's a lot of very interesting things in there. I highly recommend it. It's another J.J. Abrams job and whatnot. But in the final season, there's a point where one of the characters is being run through like a bunch of simulations, right? Like through like a VR kind of thing. But they're so real that she doesn't realize that sometimes. And so sometimes she does and sometimes she doesn't. So when she doesn't realize it, she thinks that she's, like doing something, she's on a mission. And when she does realize it, she realizes that something is being done to her, like a, a mind control training program, right? So I think that this, so it made me think of that, but I think there's a couple of things here, right? Like some people, like, I don't know if this is designed to like, because there's multiple kinds of players in this game or in this pro- program, like some people I think see themselves as investigators who are here to figure out what is going on. And there's other people who see themselves as they're here to create their own reality and live in the dream that they've created for themselves, right? Sometimes those things exist even within one person, right? Like, and they'd say for someone like you or like I, we play both parts sometimes, right? And this goes to the conversation you and I had the other day when I was talking about like how to balance that, like there's some people that take great comfort in feeling like they're just a grain of sand in the entire beach of existence and others take great comfort in feeling like they're very, very important and they're here to do something really important, right? So I think that like, this can be for different types of people, but also sort of different positions and whatever. If this is a training simulation, like a a military kind of exercise, 
Like when they do war, war game stuff in the military, sometimes you're the person being attacked. Sometimes you're the one doing the attack kind of thing, right? So it's all like the various positions you could play in the game. But this also goes to something, and I think you and I have talked about this, but like the way I do a lot of my stuff, as I call it, making stuff up and having it come true anyway, right? Which I don't mean I'm lying, I'm not saying things that are untrue, but it's like based on some experience I have, I have a thing that I believe to be true. So I will say that this is what is happening. And then all the information seems to appear to backfill it in. I just had like a huge one happen this week and that might be topic for a uh, separate show, like for you and I to kind of go through because it's pretty large and phenomenal, right? But basically I threw an anchor out years ago and made a very bold statement, right? That um, the secret space program was underneath the ground in Jackson. Right. And that to the extent that space exists, it's that that's where it is. Right. And over the years, little bits and pieces and things like that have ha have shown up to sort of, you know, add some fuel to that fire. But this weekend, I basically found uh, evidence of um, thousands of year old, like uh, what do they call the things when the Indians write on the rock walls? Um, petroglyphs. Petroglyphs. Basically confirming what I said and an entire military industrial complex structure built around these drawings to confirm what I said. Now, if we don't really understand who we are, where we are, how time exists or anything, I certainly, you know, like maybe it's just like I was having a hunch and I remembered something from my childhood and I knew about it then, but it was kind of programmed out of me. Or if this place is really far weirder than we think it is, we have a lot of control over our experience here. And because I said that everything that needed to happen in order to make the story that I made up true somehow was organized as the coincidences were organized into a pattern, right? That filled that in, that like basically I got, you know, you start with the um, like the, the fact and then you fill in all the information instead of me following it to that conclusion. I did the conclusion first, right? And then all the information filled in. So that feels like it goes along with that um, with that line as well right there. Can I run with that for a moment? Yeah. Can you, can you give me screen share? Yep. All right. Because um, <laughs> we haven't talked about, like you said, oh, wow, you took a hike on the Susquehanna. I went down to Chatsworth. You're not going to believe what I saw. Yeah, I saw the exact same thing, but different. And it's going to blow your mind. But I'm not going to go there yet because I want to stick with John Lilly. But but we're like getting somewhere. And whoever said Lilly's from Baltimore, who, I mean, do you remember this? This was like a couple, I don't know, two months ago, three months ago. We spent a, and I remember doing that. I remember we had our, we had our little talk and we're just going through the map of Baltimore and we're looking at Towson. And here's the thing. Here's the friggin' crazy thing. When I was waiting to get my, my float, when I went up last week, the, the girl who like kind of sits in the front, uh, the, who checks you in, she had a Towson shirt on. So if you remember mm -hmm. like two months ago, we were just talking about like the map of Baltimore. And I remember thinking like, I wonder if anyone else finds this interesting. Are we going to go anywhere with this? You and I were just fishing. We were on a fishing expedition. Yeah. All right. So now let's get, let's go, let's go see what we caught. All right. Um, da, 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 da. All right. So dun, dun, dun. We're going to go right. Let's start. Is this where I'm going to start? So this is, uh, this is John Lilly. You could see this is, um, uh, the John C. Lilly website. This lists the places he worked. So he worked in 1968 to 69. One year he works at seas in the Virgin Islands. He's working like, you know, National Institutes of Health. This is like when he's working, doing all of the, uh, um, uh, and here he's working National Institutes of Health. This is when he's doing all of this like Rockefeller, Sen Rockefeller Foundation funded stuff and like government stuff. And then he spends one year going to the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. And he's the chief of psychological isolation and psychedelic research. Mm -hmm. All right. And this is located in Catonsville, Maryland. Mm -hmm. So now let's go look here. So we go and we, we search that the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, uh, Catonsville, Maryland, and we get this hit. So that was in the in the late 60s that he was there. And we could see this. Uh, um, 
The Maryland Psychiatric Research Center is an internationally renowned research center which is dedicated to providing treatment with patients to patients with schizophrenia. And I, this goes without saying, uh, saying, but if anyone's ever done any um, research into schizophrenia, like it's not a thing. It's a list of, I think it's like 12 or 13 behavior sets. And if someone shows like five out of those 12s, they have schizophrenia. Like that's the, that's the test. Like, it's not like a thing like, oh, look, you got a broken bone. So like schizophrenia. And the reason I'm bringing that out is to say like, it is this very, very broad description of like some sort of like, uh, of mental processes. And so this guy was the head of it um and we see this this is the one which we're talking about so let me go back here and what uh, i'm not going to go and bore you with this right now but i'm going to give you a little bit of historical resonance the the maryland psychiatric research center is part of spring grove hospital center which is the second oldest psychiatric center in um in the americas the oldest was in williamsburg uh, Virginia, and then this was founded in uh, Maryland in the late 1700s, okay? Um, so now we're looking at it on the map. Um, just let me go look at here, right here. It's in Catonsville. So what did I call it? So right, da, da, da. let's see if it'll show me right there. So there we go. We have it right there. Um, that's where it is. And we've done like a whole bunch of stuff before and I've talked, so this is Baltimore. Remember you say Baltimore, this is Eli yeah. Lilly. Uh, John Lilly's back in his grandfather's backyard, right? Just like how mm -hmm. Frederick Gates is the guy who started the Rockefeller Foundation and then Bill Gates starts the next version of the Rockefeller Foundation called you know, the Bill Gates Foundation. We're seeing the same names over and over again, changing a little bit different. So we got Lilly, Lilly right here. But what I wanna point out though, is right here, if you, we've talked a lot, or at least I've talked a lot about this, is this is where I grew up, yeah, right here. And I always talk about how I grew up was right by where are we? Where are we looking at? Um, Fort Meade, right here. Fort Meade, Mer Fort Meade is the NSA headquarters. This is Columbia, Maryland. This is Spring Grove. Spr Columbia, Maryland was founded in 1967. John Lilly's here in 1968. Columbia, Maryland was created by this thing called the Work Group, like all of these, like these, these, um. Uh, leaders and experts in the social sciences invented Columbia as more or less, you know, a, a test facility. And I'll go and say the symbol of Columbia, which is called, um, which is called the uh, um, the people tree, is a uh, is a sculpture of a synapse. Let's see if we can go and see that uh, of like you know of what a um, Permanently where am I going right here? Where they do that anyway? So, so what I want to show you is like where this is all connected, and 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 all of the research which we're doing, it's in the same places, it's in the same locations, it's the same individuals. Okay, look over here. I haven't noticed this over here. I don't think, but down into the right, there's Pasadena. Pasadena okay. is where Caltech is, where you said John Lilly went to school with Jack Parsons, right? So that Pasadena and Los Angeles is where John Lilly went to school. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. I'm gonna pick up on what you're working on here. So one of the weird things that popped up, you remember you and I got into this weird connection between Baltimore and Los Angeles when we, I was looking at my summer camp and for some reason your summer camp was coming up in the, in the search, right? Well, when mm -hmm. I was doing the research on this area that we found back in Chatsworth this weekend, right? There was these, these petroglyphs, right? Like, it, and you're not allowed back there. You have to have permission, right? And at one point, there was a venture back there with the, uh, uh, like, the Association of Jewish Day Summer Day Camps. Now, the summer camp that I went to wasn't, per se, at least in the, to my knowledge, uh, a Jewish camp, but maybe it was, and I just didn't know that, right? So I think that's kind of interesting because that's how we had originally started this. Uh, and you talk, you've told me in private conversations, you have this weird feeling that you've been in this area that I'm kind of here from, right? And we're here able to find a lot of these sort of connections. So John, Eli Lilly, who created Prozac, right? Who his company, pharmaceutical company, he was born there in Baltimore, right? So John Lilly goes there to work in psychiatry, from psychiatrics, and Eli Lilly is from there and creates really the product that brings mass psychopharmaceuticals to 
you know, the American people, right? Yes. This is really super interesting. You, t I want to go a little bit more into like this connection with with Lily, like how have you tracked how he went from being sort of a neuroscientist and a biophysicist? I think those are kind of like his qualifications, right? Okay. And then into this psychedelic stuff. And you said pull up pull that list back up that you had. Okay, of all let me go get that. Want. I think that's right. Would this be it? Yeah, right here. All right, so look at this. So he starts out where he starts out. He gets in the middle of his career to Maryland right there, Bethesda, which is interesting. When I was living back east, I did spend time in Bethesda. So he's there in Maryland doing that stuff. But look, after Maryland, he goes to California and he works his way down. He's in Big Sur, he's in Palo Alto. Big Sur is where Esalen is. Palo Alto is where Stanford is, right? And he ends Human Software Inc., Malibu, California which Malibu, if you follow the line of the fires from Chatsworth to Calabasas to Malibu, that's where it ends up, right? So he ended his career there as the treasurer of Human Software Inc. And you and I had a conversation the other day about, I don't know if this was private or if this was on a recording, it's everything is getting blurred at this point, about, you know, one of the purposes maybe of the child trafficking is that some of us have some kind of, whether it be natural or programmed in technology inside of us, and they need certain people to be in certain places for certain things to happen because they have some sort of technological process, biological technological process going on that creates some sort of you know field for whatever is happening. Human Software Inc. Right now, when I was a kid, so like, we have these memories of underwater, I have memories of this underwater breathing training, but also the memories of being in anechoic chambers or deprivation tanks with a lot of mm, frequencies, sound, lights, kinds of things being shot at you, right? And like, okay, so the John Lilly would be the connection between that. Right, John Lilly would be the the the, the research. He, there was one thing up here, like the chief psychological isolation and psychedelic research. Now, it's always been my opinion that uh, when they they put you on high dose psychedelics, when they're you know sometimes you were in there sober, sometimes you were in there on high dose kinds of stuff, right, and whatnot. He did a lot of work both in Florida and I can find some stuff, but not as much here as the one in Florida at a place called Marineland. Right, and it, Marine Land is closed here. It's you know about it's just south of Los Angeles. And both myself and my friend Danny Katz have a very bizarre memory, separately but almost the exact same memory of basically being taken to Marine Land, not to see the show that the kids see where the dolphins and the whales play, but to basically go into these uh, you know large underwater tanks, right? And Years ago, when I was really just getting to the place where I was trying to confirm whether I had been in projects or not, I read this, this blog called the Runer blog, my friend Shane, that he wrote, I did, he wasn't my friend then, he's my friend now, who wrote it, and he talked about being taken to Marine Land as a kid to swim with the big fish, right? And so this is like a thing, this is a thing that the kids go, they think they're going to Marine Land. Now, when I went to Marine Land, I didn't walk through the front gate and have a ticket and go to the shows. I went through a gate in the back with my grandmother, went inside somewhere, don't remember anything, and then fell asleep in the car on the way home. Like, it wasn't like going to the, you know, amusement park and having a good time, right, kind of thing. It was a very weird, I went there after having been at gym, the gymnastics that day. Danny Katz has a very similar thing where she went to Marine Land and thought she was going for the shows, but ended up hurting herself and being taken to some medical facility like under the Marine Land, right? So, <laughs> right, so this is like, what is going on, right? Like this <laughs> okay, I, I'm gonna, let me show you a little something about like what goes on in Mike's inner world. So um, I don't have any memories of anything like that. What I do know is that the moment I smell an indoor pool, I feel nauseous. I do know that. Mm -hmm. I can't stand the smell of indoor pool for whatever reason. But this this has been with me my entire life. Um, I'm almost like, I, I won't say I'm obsessive, but I do it very regularly, is um, the being able to, con to know what my pulse rate is and to be able to control it and to lower it. Yeah. Like just five minutes before, like, you know, I always have to have a watch with a stopwatch on it. Like, and I just checked, like my resting pulse rate right now is 52 beats per minute. And then my other thing is how long can I hold my breath? 
<laughs> it's always been a game I've played. It's always been fun. Like it's one of my favorite things to do. Like things mm -hmm. about holding my breath and then being able to hold my breath and then being calm while holding my breath. You got um, it. Right. And so like, I just always thought that was like a quirk of my personality. But like when we're starting to like put together like these pieces and, you know, I'd be curious when we get into the second half, if anyone else has these kind of like uh, idiosyncrasies within their behavior set where they're like, oh, I just think this is me, but it has something to do with like breath. I don't have any fears of being underwater. I don't have like anything like that. I have like more so like a desire to master being underwater, my breath and my pulse. Okay. So a couple of things. And I've never swam, like swim, like swam, like competitively or anything like that. I've got no real intuition or no real strong history to pools other than like just being a normal kid in a pool. Okay. So a couple of things. So I'm not trying to, to this day, whenever I get in the pool, I will go to the bottom and try and sit on the bottom and start breathing because I think I can. Right. Like I just, it's not, I don't even think I'm going to go to the bottom and try and do that. Like that's my first instinct when I get in the water. And there was a huge tell in that Queen's Gambit show because when she dove in the water, she went and sat on the bottom of the pool. Yes, she did. Right. Okay. You can, there's, this has appeared in a few other movie, uh, like uh, television shows, but I too have memories of like very strange indoor pools, including one underground at my elementary school that was like empty. Right. Um, and, What's funny, I'm just gonna go off on an aside for a second, but like, I also have memories of being fed like very sweet, weird juice that I didn't like at the extended daycare program at my school where this underwater pool, this underground pool was. And Laura just showed me that Eli Lilly invented fruit flavoring and sugar coated pills and later invented quinine. Wow. Okay, so that, that's kind of interesting there with the fruit flavoring and that, you know, remember all the icky syrups and pills and these stuff from when we were kids, but, when I went to, at summer camp, the summer camp that I went to, I, I think I've talked about this with you before, certainly I've said on the show, I would be taken away from the other kids sometime and taken to this little smaller pool that was like near a house on the property, right? And I would be like, like go down, I would have to hold my, go in the water and stay down for a long time. Like they'd throw, like, remember those rings or like the sticks that like were different colors? So I would, they would put a lot of them down there and I'd have to get them in a certain order and, you know, not come up. And sometimes I'd be down there for minutes at a time, right? And then they also would do it with like pennies and it would be like, first find the one with 1974 on it and then find, they had to do it in a particular order, right? So it wasn't just go and get all the pennies. It was like, you have to do it in this order, which means you're down there for a long time. But I have like very clear memories of hearing them say, stop holding your breath because you have to like, be, if you hold your breath and you can't relax your pulse. And in order to be able to breathe through your skin, you have to relax your pulse. But I too am really interested in holding my breath for a long time. People often notice like, you know, I'll just get in the water and I'll swim no matter how big the pool, when I haven't even been in a pool for like a year or two, the whole length of the pool without coming up for air. And people are always like, I thought you weren't going to come up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and stay, I can stay down for a fairly long time. And if I work on it, I can, you know, do it longer. But I too have always been obsessed with seeing how long I can stay down there. And can I do it without panicking, right? Can I do it with just remaining calm? As to what you're talking about, about your pulse, like I had, you know, for someone as hyper as I am, I can, I'll, I can control my breathing and my pulse incredibly well, which doesn't seem to go together. But I had something happen one time, and I think I've talked about this before as well. I hit a man with my car right? While I was high on drugs and like in a parking lot, right? And I don't think it was because I was high on drugs. I think it was because it was raining outside and I had my slippers on and my foot slipped off the brake, but you know, he fell down and hit his head, right? And so they called the ambulance and then the police came and I'm like, fuck, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to sit here. It was the most natural thing in the world. I have this many minutes until the police get here to control my breathing, get my heart rate down, get my pupils undilated, all that kind of stuff, right? And I did. And the police came and everything, you know, even the woman, the man who I hit, her, her wife was there, like the, 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 it was cordial, right? Like it was an accident. Everything was, I felt terrible, you know what I mean? Obviously, but I knew that I, there was something in me that knew I could get myself back to completely sober. No, you know what I mean? No signs that my heart rate is agitated or anything like that. And I did. So that, I think that 
either that's a trait humans have naturally that we've been taken so far away from that you can only tap back into when you necessarily have to or if you work on it, or it's something that we were particularly trained to do and my training kicked in right there. I mean, the training thing makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a hunch right now, but, but, uh, and, and, and what I, what I'm thinking is, and, and this is the fun of what we're doing is like, you know, we're, we're, we're taking these hunches and we're following and we're getting like, you know, where did this come from? Like this, getting that meme and going through it and then delving into it. Like, you know, it's, if it, this is becoming more real, I suppose, as like, we're seeing the, the, one structure of reality is literally crumbling. Like the cultural structure is crumbling and this other structure seems to be showing itself. And the reason why I'm saying this kind of right now is because I know we only got a couple more minutes left in this first hour. And I want to bring up like the other thing which you made reference to was, was, um, was the, the petroglyphs and what you saw uh, underneath Chadsworth. Um, so, and so I want to go, let me talk first, and then I'll, I'll hand to you and let you, you close. So the first thing is, um, and I've talked about this a lot, particularly if you're familiar with my work on the Susquehanna River, is about the petroglyphs in the Susquehanna River. It's the largest collection of petroglyphs east of the Mississippi, virtually ignored by archaeologists. At It's got like a, a, a really big significance, uh, primarily um, identified by a gentleman who died in 2012, whose name was Talakiel who was the, uh, um, I mean, that's just, he, he had a, a, a connection to Mesoamerica. He was a leader within the Toltec community or the, the I can't even remember, um, the Chimmy, something other. But anyway, so there's another part. And if you've seen my book, The Rights of the 40th Parallel, and it's got four different spots. And this is the fourth spot. And I'm gonna show you some images because I was there this weekend. I went there for the first time for a while. And um, this happens to be to put into context of people's minds for where this is. So we're looking at arguably the oldest river on the planet and we are looking downstream, probably about a half a mile from where Three Mile Island is. Okay, mm -hmm. so Three Mile Island was a psyop on the same level of, <laughs> of JFK and on the same level of 9-11. Like something happened, but it was a psyop. And like, and I've gone into that and I see Steve put in the comment about his Columbia, about Freeman's, um, Freeman's documentary on Columbia. And that was a big inspiration on me. And I did a huge thing linking Susquehanna, Sequana, Columbia, and all this sort of places on the river. But I want to show you some of the photographs of this one particular place. And I'm going to show you the stones. And the conclusion which I came from is like, you know, this is that we're looking at technology, which is, um, older on a time period, which I, you know, I don't even want to be silly enough to, to, to suggest, but I'm going to show you guys some pictures and then, and then I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay. Are you ready? Okay. Yep. All right. So, um, look at this. This is a stone. This is a natural stone. Look at this Pantina. Yeah. Look at this right here. Look at this line. You see this right here? Yep. The entire place is filled with all of these unnatural straight lines and circles. Um, to me, I see it as a coding and we're seeing the coding is broken off. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, remember, this isn't just some random place. These stones are nowhere. There aren't any stones like this anywhere else on the Susquehanna, just in this one particular location, which is where Three Mile Island is, where a supposed nuclear event occurred. Um, we can see, let me see where we got some more. Um, we've got these strange drilled in holes. Mm -hmm. This is some of the hardest stone out there, okay? This is a, this looks more like a naturally forming one, what they would call a pothole, but these are drilled in holes. Um, let's see, I think I even have, I would say they were taking core samples right here. There's no sort of markings around it. That may be a so this is what they look like. Yeah. You see these lines? You see how this is above, like this is rain. Look at that. And that's crazy. That line right there. Oh, and right lines there. are like that all over the place. And they yeah. stretch from stone to stone. Uh, this is what, let me see. So this is what it looks like. I, I, so these lines right here, and they stretch like across like these lines. Yeah. Like you can't like you, the, the stone is so hard. Look at this. 
and they stretch for like 40, 50 feet in a straight line across yep. different stones. Yep. Like, look at all of these right here. So the only thing that really seems to, <laughs> the closest stones I've seen to this are the ones like maybe the, um, in Machu Picchu. Yep. You could see. So that's what I, so when you say to me, this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, that it is a, um, there's an ancient military uh, <laughs> um, uh, base maybe built underground. I'm like, I think there's one right here too. Or there's something that happened, which is very, very, very unusual and significant. And we know that by these like historical markers, these ritual spots that happen. Okay, so basically this area in Chatsworth where I live is on Sant, Sant or I grew up, I didn't, I lived a few miles from there, but I, I went to camp here and I hung out back in this area. It's on Santa Susanna Pass. We've talked about that before, right? So Susquehanna, Susanna, it's a similar name. There also, in my opinion, was a radi radi uh, radiation spill psyop there. That the story is that you know there is this huge radiation spill and that there's all been all of this destruction of land and whatnot. And in my opinion, in my just intuition, this is all noise to keep people from going back there, so that they're free to toil away with whatever they've discovered under the ground back there. And people aren't going to go near there and check and see what's going on because they're afraid they're going to get cancer. Right. So how is it that your spot and my spot? are both just downwind a few miles from some place where there were supposedly the biggest radiological spills to the, then this, that radiological spill also happened in like the sixties or seventies here in Los Angeles. Yeah. yeah. Right. There's, so, there's... Which then begs the question, what the fuck was Fukushima? But that's a separate issue, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, now, I don't know what else there is along where you are there, but here, what there is, is Boeing and Rocketdyne, right, which we did some deeper research into what was really going on there, right, and, and I think I understand why now, but for people who've been following some of the things I've been saying over various shows, check out this FPV Angel YouTube channel, because they're talking about basically an underground machine that has been there for since the beginning of time that basically all of these military companies, governments, organizations, they want us to believe that they put it there, but really they just set up base around it to try and control it, figure out how it works, limit access to it, see what they can learn from it, blah, 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 right? All that kind of stuff. And I actually think part of the reason of having projects with children around there is because they don't know how it works and they're hoping the kids with their creative mind and their, you know, especially kids who can remote view, which also John Lilly's work always brings up Project Stargate, which is a remote viewing program. And he looks suspiciously like Russell Targ, who talks about, um, you know, remote viewing. I'm not saying there's a connection, but just those synchronicities and the kind of linking of things, um, you know, that they, they, I think they don't know how this shit really works. Right. And they're fucking they're doing stupid shit. Maybe they're creating some environmental catastrophes and things. But it's interesting how we get this. I mean, it's almost impossible unless there's a coincidence control network that you and I would spend our trying time exploring these areas where we have had meaningful experiences and there have been supposed radiation spills that have, you know, devastated the area. Just well, uh, you bring up like it. That that makes a lot of sense in terms of like uh, to me when you say that they bring the children there to um, creatively explore and to see what they come up with. Okay, well, maybe if the machine is in water, let's say deep, heavy saline water, kind of like what you get in a float tank, right? And then you need to send kids down there or something to check it out and see what's going on. The kids need to be able to breathe in that environment. Yeah, and kids. Uh, Kid, kids are better. Uh, let me show you one last thing. The one last thing, because it's so because you brought it up, so I got to show it to you. So, um, all right, and because I love the maps. So this is D.C. This is Baltimore. This is Chesapeake Bay. This is the Susquehanna River. Remember, the, Sus the Chesapeake Bay and the Susquehanna River are the same body of water. Um, it just changes from river to estuary right here. 50% of the Chesapeake Bay water does come from the Susquehanna River. Right here, this is where the, where the military industrial complex began. Here's the first computer. It's called ENIAC. Okay. So we're going to go up. Um, this is where Harrisburg is, Three Mile Islands right here. This is where um, 
this is where I just showed you, um, where I just showed you those stones. It's called Falmouth Boat Drop. It's right next to um, Hershey. Like the, at one point was the largest, you know, chocolate manufacturer. All the chocolate was made right here. But what I want to show you, the end right here is where the Susquehanna River petroglyphs are. It's right here. And this is probably like from here to here is how far? That's like, uh, I would imagine, I don't know, like probably like 15, 20 miles. But anyway, this is what I want to show you. Um, you said, what else is around here? So this is the town I used to live. We pulled this up last time. Oh, I may even showed it to you last time. I'll just bring it back up. I'll tell you again. This is Marietta. That's where I used to live on the Susquehanna River. And right here is Glaxo Smith Klein. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have two vaccine manufacturing plants in the United States. This is one of them. Hmm. Operation Warp Speed. GlaxoSmithKline is one of the two, one of like the three companies which is said to make of the of the billion U.S. vaccines. Right, and this is where they're going to make it. Right, all right, right there, all right. in the middle of nowhere. In right? the middle of nowhere. All right, Let, you stop screen sharing so I can screen share because I just noticed a couple of things that were I thought were interesting. Let me just pull up a map of Chatsworth. Let me see if I can, I'm not as good with maps as you are. You're much quicker, all right, than I am. But let's see what I can do here. Hold on just a second. All right, let's see if I can make it work the way I want to make it work. Okay, guys, please bear with me. I'm technologically challenged. All right, so here's Southern California. Let's see if I can figure out how to zoom in. Nope, I don't know how to do this. How do I make Lower it? right corner with the plus and the minus. All right, hold on, let me go back. Uh, let's go back, let me move my people over here so I can see. Okay, so how do I make it so I can scoot the whole map down? So just grab onto it and hold down with your, your clicker and then move it. Okay, there we go. There you go. All right. uh, you, could, you could minimize the uh, Los Angeles on the left uh, with a little um, triangle next to the X. If you click on that, go up, triangle go up, the X. go up, there you go. Click on that, there right to go. the right. No, to the right. Oh, that'll work too. That's okay. Better. Okay. And then on the bottom right, that's how you uh, make it larger or smaller. Okay. Plus and minus. So I'm going to go a little bit bigger there. So, okay. So here we are. So this is Chatsworth right here where I grew up. Okay. The area that we're talking about is right here. Okay. And then you can go through the other side of this Santa Susana Pass comes out at Bell Canyon. Then you have Calabasas, Malibu, and whatnot. Right. So, I noticed on your map, three air, three towns with the same names, Bel Air, Lancaster, and Pasadena. Watch this. All right, All so right. over here, I'm gonna do my best to control. Let's see if I can figure this out. How do I do it? All right, Lancaster, is that Lancaster? How far away is that? Like, it, 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 so if you just go over, if you didn't have to like, you could do a direct shot, probably 30 miles, but the way you have to travel, maybe more like 45, gotcha. okay. Okay. Yeah. 45. Let's see if I can. Yeah, if you right click like you just did, you could do measure distance between two points. Here's Pasadena. Okay. All right. Bel Air. So in almost the same setup it was, where they were for you in your situation, Bel Air was down, Lancaster was up into the down, up into the right, and Pasadena was down into the right. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. So I just thought that was kind of kind of another part of this that is fucking interesting and weird and fascinating, right? So well, and and both of these areas were like the, I mean, if you want to go back to your your history, like um, these were both like California and Pennsylvania were both very significant to the founding of the Rosicrucians. Yeah. Like, you know, particularly Lancaster with the effort of cloister and and uh, everything that was done in Philadelphia, which brought to the Susquehanna River. And then usually when we think about like the Rosicrucians, we think about more so in the Northern California, but nonetheless, like they went right after they did the East Coast, like uh, who was, was it Drake, I think, who went around and um, arguably that was really, it was in California is where the Rosicrucians first um, 
uh, this uh, of the English made their first colonies, like you know, um, in the New World. So they were looking at these two sides of the world. It it, it should make a lot of sense that there's going to be mirroring. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of those people who, like, even like within these like psychedelic intellectual people, they did a portion of their career in Northern California, and then ultimately they ended up down here in Southern California. So there's something else about this area. All right, we're going to end this part, but quickly before I do, I just want to clean something up. Eli Lilly did not invent quinine, he produced it. So I think there's a way of producing it synthetically as opposed to what's available organically in certain items. So he produced it, not invented it. Um, it was one of the first medicines that he produced right? And it upped his profits tenfold. And at, remember, this has been one of the controversial aspects of this period of time we're in right now with coronavirus, because uh, the hydroxychloroquine, right, is basically has quinine in it, right? And a lot of people who are into natural medicine were saying, oh, you know, you can use quinine, right? Like a lot of people in Africa who uh, take malaria medication, which is hydroxychloroquine they also some some of the tribes have naturally occurring quinine and this is the thing that keeps them safe from that and there's been a lot of weird connections between quote unquote coronavirus and malaria and this oddity of the hydroxychloroquine and the quinine so interesting that he's involved in that too yeah okay and eli lily's also eli lily apparently also has a coronavirus treatment that's been authorized known as bamlana vimabab Vim vimab and um, yeah, I'm not going to go deep into it now, but it appears that Eli Lilly has an, an authorized coronavirus treatment. So what, for whatever that is, Laura found some of that while we were looking. So let's wrap up this recording here for the people that are watching at home. You guys can find Michael at SusquehannaAlchemy.com. You guys know where to find me. You can find me right here. If you would uh, like to join us for the Project Kids Workshop, which today's will be following this. If you'd like to join us and participate or even just obtain the workshops to observe for yourself, hit me up. You can hit me up here in the comment section or on email Emily C. Moyer at protonmail.com, patreon.com forward slash off planet media. We will see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Yeah.